Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Scale Automation, People and Technology Considerations. My name is David Goodstein. I'm a Member Services Coordinator for the Institute for Robotics Process Automation and Artificial Intelligence. We're proud to be the host of today's event with Copac. We encourage you to submit your questions to today's speakers at any time. To do so, please click on the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click on the submit box. Today's webinar will be recorded, and you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to the recorded webinar. It will also be available on our website at erpai.com. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Dan Goodstein. Dan? Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Dan Goodstein. I, I head up the media and events business here at ERPA AI, and thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, probably the top uh, topic that uh, our members ask us about, certainly over the last three or four months, is um, about scaling, right? How do, you, how do you scale this? All right, we've, got, we've had some success, uh, but uh, now we need to scale it. Um, and so I'm glad we're talking not only about the technology ramifications of, of scaling, but also the people ramifications of, uh, of scaling today. So uh, thanks to uh, the team at COFAX for uh, supporting this and a series uh, of uh, webinars um, and, uh, and Pinochle, who really uh, will be helping us with uh, what's really more of a conversation today uh, around uh, their experience, their journey, the, what they went through in uh, implementing and scaling. Uh, and so we have a really good kind of uh, discussion uh, planned uh, to kind of give you an inside look at uh, the inner workings of what's involved in, in really uh, getting to scale. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speakers, just a brief overview on ERPA AI. We are a professional association uh, and marketplace uh, focused on uh, all types of automation, RPA, intelligent automation, and AI and cognitive uh, services. Uh, if you are on the, uh, the buy side of the equation, we have a variety of education and networking opportunities as well as uh, proactive uh, assistance programs for you. Uh, and if you're sort of on the sell side, uh, a variety of uh, sales, marketing, and promotional opportunities. So if we could help you uh, with anything on your journey, please uh, reach out to me or someone on my team. So let me introduce the, the speakers today. As I mentioned, we've got uh, a, a great uh, panel here. Uh, we have Chris Huff, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at COFAX. Uh, David Halligan, he's the Senior Director of Professional Services there. Um, and Christopher Jackson, who uh, is Head of Strategic Applications and Data Architecture at Pinochle Insurance. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, each of you to introduce yourself briefly and maybe give a little bit of background on, uh, on your experience. Uh, Christopher, can I ask you to go first? Yeah, my name is Christopher Jackson, and uh, I've been with Pinnacle Assurance um, off and on over the past three years. And so my background is really around uh, history and enterprise content management, and um, and what I'll be talking through today is kind of some of our our challenges and 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 approaches for how we went about attacking um, RPA. Great, thanks, David. Hey, um, I'm David Halligan from COFAX. I've been with COFAX Professional Services for 11 years. Um, I look after the EMEA organization uh, solutions team. Um, we're most frequently asked about um, how a customer can evolve from um, an early adopter of intelligent automation technologies um, and build scale in their practice. Great, thanks. And uh, Chris, Chris, if you could introduce yourself, and uh, I think we'll kind of segue to you to help us set the stage for the conversation. Sounds good, Dan. Chris Huff, Chief Strategy Officer at COFAX. I have been at COFAX for about seven months. Five years previous to that, I led for Deloitte Consulting in the U.S. Um, public sector, the robotics, cognitive automation, chatbot, and blockchain business. Um, and in that capacity, delivered in a vendor-neutral stance. So have good levels of experience across the vendor base, um, and that's what you'll be receiving today is a, a very vendor neutral um, approach. Um, but what I what I would say is that I love the fact that ERPA has has taken this on um, in terms of addressing the scalability challenges because this is something that oftentimes is overlooked because innovation is hard. Um, and if it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. But the fact of the matter is, is that RPA and intelligent automation is innovative. Um, it's something new. It's, it's challenging. And I think some of the vendors sold it as being too easy initially. 
and that's why you have this sense of automation exhaustion going in um, and going across the marketplace right now um, because the challenge resides in scaling and the enterprise value is achieved at scale not in small pockets of automation and so we're addressing it head on today and Pinnacle Assurance and Chris Jackson are going to share with you how they were able to achieve scale, but more importantly, what they're doing to sustain that scale. So with that, I think we can jump right in. To set context to why, one, the technology is critical, but two, the value that it drives is to understand that it's not just about the technology. It's about the people. So if you look through the lens of history, you've got the four industrial revolutions, and most would argue and contend that we are currently encroaching in on the, the 4.0. And the 4.0, if you think about it, it's really the convergence of the digital economy and the physical world. And those companies and, and software vendors, frankly, that are going to be the most successful are those that effectively navigate the management of that digital economy and physical world to either drive into their industry or to take software to market to enable it. But if you think about that convergence as the digital workforce, which again are these 4.0 digital solutions in the physical world, so the people, the, the, the operations that are required to be brought together, that collectively is what I would define as the digital workforce. It is not simply the technology side of it. Um, it, 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 it definitely includes the people side, and frankly, as you get into change management, we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, that is a long pull in the tent, as some would say, the thing that needs to be addressed but oftentimes isn't and will really serve as an obstacle to, to scaling a program. On the next slide, what you see is that it's not just about 4.0, but it's about understanding that as we've approached 4.0, we brought forward automation, which largely was Industrial Revolution 3.0. This was bringing computers, IT, and automation into the workplace. And then we started to make things more mobile, smartphones, tablets, and that was great. But what we did while we were achieving that is we began to now realize that, wow, our data, our transactions, our people, our systems are more disparate and disconnected than ever before. And the answer that we typically have today to connect all of this are people. People sitting in the middle, grabbing data from different systems, grabbing data from different regions of the world, and pulling it together to then make sense of it. What we would position intelligent automation as is that connective tissue residing in the middle, that automation backbone, that can really serve as the connector between the data, the systems, and the people. And so intelligent automation isn't a thing. It's not a point solution. It's a collection of automation capabilities that when brought together realizes the sum of parts value. And as we step through this, David Halligan is going to take it from Cofax and speak to the product and capability perspective. But Chris Jackson is the true rock star of the show today and is going to show you from a buy side, bringing it into an organization, how it actually manifests itself and the level of effort that's required to keep it ongoing. So with that, I will turn it over to David. Okay. Um, so Co Cofactor's consulting service team have worked with a good many uh, organizations who are on their submission technologies. Um, some of those organizations are trialing for the first time uh, and they're skeptical about the benefits. Um, other in the market that are um, considered to be mature, um, knowledgeable decision makers. They've narrowed their selection to one or two preferred uh, technology vendors. Um, almost certainly they've performed some earlier uh, automations and they're looking to scale up their efforts into an enterprise initiative. Um, alternatively, um, early adopters have got tens or hundreds of automations that have been created in an uncontrolled way. Um, they're now facing a those automations. Um, what the maintenance issue is um, the costly upgrade to take advantage of advancements in technology, potentially infrastructure costs and a large desktop um, running automations 
Um, and, and they might be managing multiple vendor relationships and carrying annual costs uh, for each of those automations, which is challenging the initial. Um, so um, it starts with a manageable, scalable um, um, Cofactors is automation platform provides this. The technology exists. It's been proven with many customer automations. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's a connective tissue between many technologies that already existed. Um, cognitive services are surface capable integrated um, utilized by a browser and desktop automation, which are leveraged by the RPA platform. Um, simple, intuitive design, management and analytics capabilities. Uh, use cases are deployed to a flexible server-side infrastructure um, or deployed to a desktop. Um, scaled on demand can be fully hosted in a cloud environment um, as appropriate um, security and governance built in. Um, in automations are okay. more than applets, uh, maybe chatbots. Um, the plat platform provides a way of knowledge workers and automation so an intelligent automation platform uh, built some years tradition, which is one of the reasons that Chris uh, from chose Cofax Intelligent Automation. Chris. Um, yeah. So let me let me just speak to kind of um, what Pinnacle looked at when we were thinking about um, trying to identify the right platform um, for intelligent automation for us. So uh, really we were looking for, I think like David was saying, something that was very scalable, um, very reliable, and very flexible. And th those are all great things. And uh, what we found was, you know, going through some, some different uh, vendor selections, we were able to settle on, on, a, on a solution that, that was a COFAX solution. And uh, we've we've been very happy with it so far. So in the next coming slides, we'll talk a little bit more to that. Um, but really, I think the the biggest proposition for us of, of of why we chose the solution was based upon the flexibility and and um, the way we could make you know this tool into that connective tissue. How we could kind of uh, inter interwove it with our existing business processes and uh, and and get uh, buy in from our business. Uh, when, once they understand that, hey, this is a this is a tool that is you know here to help you, and we as a team are here to help you. That was uh, the approach we we took. Yeah, Chris. So that that's a great point because oftentimes what what I'm hearing out there is that uh, we step into it. We we have an appreciation for RPA. We we step off in terms of our pilot proof of concept, and then we find business cases that we apply it to. And then we quickly start to understand that to get the maximum of value, we actually need to start to bolt on other solutions uh, like Capture because maybe there are paper documents that hold unstructured data that needs to be transformed to structured. So you need to be able to pull that document into an image and then extract that unstructured text um, into structured data so that way RPA can then pick it up and process it. And, and unfortunately, the numbers out there that most analysts will, will give you is that the enterprise holds about 70 plus percent of its data in unstructured format. So only 30 percent of it actually starts in structured format, which is why you see, regardless of an RPA vendor, and most of you on the webinar um, that may not be with Cofax, you might have seen your RPA vendor retrofit your RPA project with, with a capture capability or with a workflow capability in order to add more rigor and discipline because not everything adheres to a rule set. So what do you do with those exceptions? And I think the essence of finding the right technology that works for you, if you're looking to scale, is to not look at it as a point solution, but intelligent automation as a collection of process orchestration, uh, cognitive capture, so being able to pull in this unstructured data. But that, that's something that, that we're hearing quite often is that if you're really going to scale, you're going to have to extend beyond just starting with structured data. So let, let's take a step back at this point. Let me just introduce Pinnacle Assurance a little bit more. 
So Pinnacle Assurance is a workers' comp company in Colorado. We only work within Colorado, and we only do one thing. <laughs> it's workers' comp insurance, and we do it better than anyone. Uh, we have over 57,000 customers, uh, and our main focus is to make our customers happy. Um, so Pinnacle, uh, we're very big on vision. We're very big on mission. So as a, as, a, as a corporation, our vision is to lead a revolution in caring for people, businesses, and our community. And our mission tied to that is to provide caring protection for Colorado employers and their employees. And that is a really great vision and mission statement. And I think probably everyone on the call has similar mission, vision and mission statements within their company. Um, but I think the challenge uh, of, of us as employees is to make those uh, vision and mission statements as real as possible. So when we were starting to talk about RPA um, and, and how it could, you know, weave and, and, and kind of help guide us on this, on our journey for our mission or vision statement, we really were facing some initial challenges that I think are probably very similar to those challenges of other, other people on the call. Um, really highly manual inefficient processes. Uh, we, we had a whole bunch. We still have, we still have a whole bunch. <laughs> um, we, we have a very strong pressure within the corporation to innovate. And that's not a negative thing, but it's, it's, it's a reality and it's, it's something that um, whether we're in IT or whether we're in customer service, there is the belief here that innovation does, you know, can't come from anywhere and that ideas can come from anywhere and that when those ideas and that innovation comes about, uh, it's up to us to execute on it. Um, tied to that is just a pressure to do more with less. And I think we're all feeling that. Um, one of the things we'll talk about here when we get into this is I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my team. And my team is small. Um, there, there is only five individuals on my team. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we kind of organized our team around the work we had. And the biggest thing is just the fear of the unknown. And that that's a real, true, honest fear. And I think that's why we keep trying to talk to the human aspect. And, and I you know, I'll talk about that a lot as we go through here. It's just um, when you're implementing uh, any sort of uh, intelligent automation um, technology or technology in general, it, you really have to empathize with your customers, your, your coworkers, and really truly understand where they're coming from because it is a fearful thing. It is, it is a, it's scary to to have someone come in and start talking about automating uh, something you've been doing for years. And, and so you really have to approach that gently. You really have to listen to the customer, listen to that fear, feel that fear yourself, and then come up with a plan that addresses it. Yeah, Chris, so, something that comes to mind in terms of fear and overcoming it um, is, and, and we'll talk a little bit about, about it on, on the slide, but is involving the workforce that's going to be impacted via the automation during the design uh, process. So not doing it in the boiler room, rather doing it with the workforce and having them be part of the solution as opposed to springing the solution on them and expecting them just to embrace it. Um, so what, what I, we want to do here, oh, Chris? Oh, I would just want to, I, I, sorry, I just want to jump in because that's a really great point. Um, it is really something, again, that I'll talk about a little bit more, but when we're going, when you're going through and executing this work, you really do have to make the business part of the work, and it's really got to be a partnership. So I agree with that 100. percent Yeah, I think about so it, some of the things. Yeah, if you, if you think about some of the the real life practical things that all of us have encountered in terms of automation creeping into our lives, I mean, think about th think about the smartphone that we all are looking at and probably thumbing through right now. That was a consolidation of value pools that brought a lot of automation into one device. I mean, we were previously, I may be aging myself here, but we were previously printing out MapQuest directions to find one place to the next. And now we've got this GPS that has now been brought right in front of us into this single device. Um, and through automation, it has empowered us to do more and accomplish more in a shorter amount of time. Um, instead of having to print, you know, marry up all those pages together, set it in a car, and then try to pay attention to that while you're driving. But automation, when it's embraced, I think can empower the person as opposed to displace the person. I think that's a great point, Chris. So um, I think maximizing the investment in the platform requires an equal focus on, on people, roles, and responsibilities. 
Um, and it involves creating a core team of automation practitioners who bring different capabilities, um, different responsibilities for establishing good practice, uh, appropriate use of technology, um, help to establish a, an enterprise-wide program. Um, needs to include people with uh, strong technical competencies, but more importantly, people with business change management and operational excellence experience. Um, it, it, it definitely is about how you structure that core team of, of people. Um, it's about being able to respond to change quickly enough. Um, individual contributors who push the boundaries of the technology and take advantage of it. But then you need to be able to document um, and, and create guidance around how you then scale that up. Um, that, that's the, um, uh, the, the, the function of an intelligent automation program. Um, a competency center within the organization that are responsible for innovation and creativity, staying ahead of the game, um, but also documenting lessons learned in the shape of best practice, evangelizing about the benefits and mentoring uh, the core automation factory on how they can best leverage the platform. Um, I think um, not, not enough consideration can be given to the people who make up that core team. Um, I think it, it is critical to identify the right individuals. Yeah, I would agree 100% again on that. Uh, and one thing that you mentioned that again kind of touches a chord is, is uh, you know, the creativity that needs to be enabled. And so when 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 we go in over here in this next slide, I'm going to talk kind of through our work of how we went about and executed this. Um, we wanted to have a controlled process, obviously, because um, any tool that is flexible and scalable has the potential to, um, if, if not controlled, you know, cause some issues. <laughs> so we really wanted to, you know, organize around the work, but we also want to organize around the work in a way where we're not locking down our, our people who are using the tool and we're, let it, we're letting them, you know, be creative or let them be innovative or letting them work quickly. And that's a big thing. That's another big thing that, is, you know, is for us at Pinnacle is that we want to work fast. We want to innovate. We don't want to stifle that innovation. So uh, what I would say is, you know, we kind of built upon those guiding principles that we were just talking about in the last slide, and we really broke out our work into our own framework, which I think any any company would do. And so I'll just talk to the, re, you know, the, the reasons why we came up with this framework, kind of what our thinking was behind it, and then, and then how we executed through it. Um, so obviously, you know, that's why we're on this call is education. Education is really important, and that's on that's on both the side of the execution and on the business side. So on on the execution side, we had no IA experience. We we bought the we we bought the tool. We knew we want we had some use cases we were thinking about, but we didn't really have any big projects lined up. We didn't have people trained. Um, so we we kind of jumped in and said, okay, we we've got this we've got this uh, nice platform we can work with. Now it's time to get serious about it. So let's get a plan around how we're gonna execute it. So the first thing we did was start getting our, our, our team trained. So like I mentioned before, I have five team members. And so immediately we jumped in and started having the team train. Um, and we ended up getting all five of them certified. But the, two, the, the first two people that we got certified were not technical. They did not come from a development background. Um, and that was not what they did. And, and that's what I think also, again, is the beauty of this is that um, they, they, they didn't maybe have some of those constraints that sometimes uh, developers uh, we can have um, around, you know, thoughts and thought patterns and things like that. So that was something that was really great. We got, we got them educated. We got them going. And then tied to that, we were getting the business going and we we're getting the business educated. So we're reaching out and talking to the business. This is when we start evangelizing. And we really had to evangelize. So we, we went about, you know, anywhere we could, talking to our stakeholders, setting up uh, lunch and learns, um, setting up one-on-one, -on -one, you know, meetings, and talking to them about the capabilities of what we were trying to do. And then, again, empathizing with them and saying, hey, we're not here to, we're not here to replace you. We're not here to take these jobs away. We're here to, going back to our vision statement, we're here to, you know, empower you to go in and work with our customers. We want you to focus on our customers and not focus on pushing that paper down the line or making sure you're going and updating that content that, that the same way you do every day that comes from the same source every day. 
uh, once you start, you know, evangelizing and kind of building your pipeline, uh, you then have to obviously coincide that with getting organized around the work. So we touched on it a little bit in the last slide of, of, of kind of coming up with a with an IA uh, team that is is formed around the work and and their sole purpose is to execute the work and, and manage the work. And part of that is coming up with structured intake processes, stru um, st structured processes for building, and structured processes for delivery. So our, our intake process was is pretty straightforward. We reach out to the customers. We have a pretty simple um, matrix that we go through, asking questions along the lines of, uh, you know, what what are the tasks you're looking at doing? How many people are involved in this? What's the number of hours they take? What are the type of documents or content you have? What are the sources of this content? And then we have a simple matrix that that we created to try to you know identify how uh, plausible it is to execute uh, automation on this. You know, if, and it's a simple one through five, and we go and grade it. And if you know the higher the better, that means it's something that you know could be uh, automation. If it's lower, you know maybe we're approaching it the wrong way, or it's just not the you know right solution. I think we'll we'll talk some more about it, that again. It's just that this is not um, a golden hammer that's going to fix everything. And, and be everything for you. You have to really be strategic in how you go about executing your work. That ties into implementing and scale. So uh, we we started small, and we we execute on on small low hanging fruit. That also helped our our people get up to speed on how to use the tool. It helped the business get up to speed on what the tool the tools could provide, and it also helped get some buy in from the business. So that you know going back to evangelization. You know, we start. We stopped having to be uh, evangelizing so much because now we had created some evangelists in the business for us. And uh, the big thing is once you once you kind of go through and you implement and you start small, you have you have your processes going, you have your structures in place for your execution of work. You really have to focus on continuously improving. So as we all know, the marketplace uh, in general is just moving quickly. There's new things coming at us, new technologies. Uh, new, new innovations, and you have to, you know, keep 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 up with that. And so you have to continuously improve. That's training with your people. That's training with the business. That's improving your delivery. That's improving. Uh, that's improving your operations and and how you execute your operations. So we kind of took those principles, and uh, we execute on that plan for nine months in 2018. Nine months in 2018. We we got five of the team members certified. We also got an additional three members in the business certified, and we have uh, several other um, uh, members of the business that are actively in training right now. And I talked on it uh, about the multiple lunch and learns. But another thing that we did is we established a bot club in the business, and this actually you know this was kind of a, a brainchild between us and the business, and the business executes this bot club, which is great. And that's that's another thing where it's not us evangelizing, it's actually the business. But there's a bot club here that has 20 individuals in it. They're from the business. They they go through and they talk about robots. They talk about potential uh, robots. They share their learnings of what they're working on, and it and it's really it's really fun and it's really innovative to go and talk to. But by the end of the year, we kind of gone through. We had deployed 40 robots, 40 automations, uh, within across eight different departments in the company. And the, the real big takeaway is that amongst those 40 robots, we were saving almost 41 hours a week. And this is low. This is the low-hanging fruit stuff. So this really sets us up to be excited for the, for the coming year and uh, for the future of what we're going to be going through uh, with more and more of these automations. Hey, Chris, quick, quick, quick question for you. For those, for those employees that were upskilled through the automation, either augmenting what they were doing are empowering them. And what what did that look like, and, and what was the sentiment from the employees? Well, you know, really, it kind of grew organically, to be honest. So yeah. our approach was 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 a partnership, and so when we went and built um, the automations, we built them with the business, and so they're it, they're active working sessions, and kind of why we started going, you know, they would start pointing things out, and and we just said, hey, you know, you want to take control? Do you want to? Do you want to go and start, you know, taking control? And over time, they took control, and they started going and and, and executing on it. And then that then that fed kind of the thirst for knowledge. Once they realized, hey, I could do this. This is something that I can handle. This is not this is not this 
this big this big albatross, this big this big thing that I don't want to carry. This this is something that you know is is going to help me with my with my work and and give me some something new and exciting to, to try and work on. And we really tried to foster that. We really tried to foster that. That's awesome. I I love the idea of a bot club. Um, I think uh, uh, really collaborating with the business is uh, is critically important. Um, as he's bringing some structure to that core team, um, uh, identifying specific roles and responsibilities. So um, we recommend that there's a there's a head of um, uh, automation practice who drives the initiative at an executive level. Um, uh, and I guess in in Pinnacle, that's you, Chris. Um, gains sponsorship and buy-in into the program, um, engages with the business leaders and sets strategic direction for the group um, and aligns how to measure the success or failure of automations against strategic initiatives such as um, improving customer satisfaction uh, survey scores, um, in turn for customer retention um, and, and streamline the customer experience um, to make it uh, as frictionless as possible. Um, set that as a strategic goal and it helps drive the automation initiatives behind it, um, work out how to measure those automations in line with that strategic goal. So what impact did you have um, on uh, customer retention as, as, as the end success factor? Um, you need a business outreach function. So it sounds like you did a really good job of creating that, um, uh, the, 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 the business outreach function, evangelizing really well. Um, creating enthusiasm and demand, um, being able to um, qualify um, uh, how um, appropriate the technology is to, to meet a certain automation requirement. Um, the bot club um, also helps um, to uh, in that business outreach um, uh, function to be able to teach the business to be uh, self-sufficient um, and, and drive their own automations and really be in control. Um, we talked earlier about um, the fear factor. And I think um, uh, what what you did there involving the business has just taken away the fear. Um, they know what the, the automations are doing. They know it's not not coming for their job. Um, it, it's really about um, working side by side and taking some of that repetitive um, um, mundane um, activity away from them to allow them to focus on more strategic initiatives and, and, and improving um, uh, their business to be able to serve their customers better. Um, I think one of the things that you can't overlook, though, is you need a real strong relationship with other supporting functions in the business. So um, good relationship with IT, um, you're going to be impacting upon the behavior and, and, and maybe even security of other applications um, in your enterprise. Um, you need to be able to articulate the message, maybe even a champion within IT that can help get stuff done. Um, a good relationship with security and compliance. Um, the, the, the automations are going to need access um, to be able to do things. Um, you need a, a good relationship with HR. Again, they may preside over the impact on the human workforce and how um, the, those freed up hours are redeployed to more strategic um, initiatives um, and, and a relationship with procurement and, and in turn uh, your vendor relationships. Um, so th this is what we think makes up um, Intelligent Automation Program Office. Um, and, and is, is our framework, um, but you put this into practice, right, Chris? Uh, we, we did, and um, we really wanted, again, to be kind of flexible and not uh, overly stringent, but you do have to have controls in place in order to execute effectively, uh, but we just didn't want to stifle uh, the ability to move quickly and our, our kind of our innovative path that we were going down. Um, but you cannot you cannot execute this work. You cannot do it at scale at all unless you have some sort of program office. You have to have some sort of structure around this if you want to succeed. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that this doesn't th this can look heavy and if it's not presented and articulated and communicated out effectively, it's going to be taken as wow. I've got to make a huge investment. An executive is going to see that slide and go, I need to make a huge investment. And that's not always the case. Some of this is, is planning for the future. Um, but to take into account all of those things that you're going to need during your pilot to ensure that, one, you can scale and then you can succeed at sustaining at scale, these are the things that need to be taken into consideration. 
What's also important to note is that you likely already have people doing these kinds of things within your organization, which is why on the bottom you saw all of those support roles. Those roles are largely already being filled by people in your organization. This is simply a, a sub-bullet to the position description, and they will now start to govern digital solutions, RPA and intelligent automation, as part of these other things that they're governing and providing support services to. And so didn't want anybody to come away from that slide thinking that we need to hire, you know, 15 people day one in order to support this, that this model is something that you can grow into over time. So this takes it a little bit deeper, talking about the six competencies within um, the automation program. And I know, David, um, this was uh, one, one of the items that, uh, in, in just leading up to this, we had been going back and forth about uh, just kind of the, the practicality of, of, of the approach that's shown here and kind of how Pinnacle went um, about going, about handling this work. So I don't know if you want to touch on kind of basically where, where, where the, these ideas were right. coming from and kind of what the framework was that you were approaching it as. Correct. So um, we, we, we talked a lot about governance and, and I guess we we went back and forth on um, the, the term center of excellence um, and, and, and we chose, we settled on intelligent automation practice because we felt that center of excellence really paints that picture of a, of a, of a huge governance model. Um, I know it's a term that people are familiar with, and uh, but, but really with intelligent automation, it's really enabling people to make use of the technology. It's not heavy, um, and, and it's not about stifling creativity by locking down the way that the uh, intelligent automation platform is used. Um, it, it's really about enabling... Um, understanding, um, being able to advise on best practice and, and guidelines, being able to make sure the right training and the right tools are in place, um, uh, being able to with the offender um, so, so, that you, so that you can uh, understand what's on their roadmap and, how you can, uh, and, and also about how you measure the performance of those automations. So how do you have visibility over something that's just happening in the background um, r rather than, um, uh, you know, people move on, um, take on new strategic initiatives and, and that activity that was a, a monotonous, repetitive activity now just happens in the background and nobody, nobody pays any attention to it. So you need um, to be able to put performance metrics and, and, and dashboards and visibility around those automations so that you can see how well they're performing. Um, you also need to be able to measure the impact of those automations uh, in the business and IT landscape. So th these are the six key functions um, that, that we believe that that intelligent automation program um, uh, should perform. Uh, this is Chris Jackson, and just some things I want to touch on on the slide that I that really struck a note is um, when it comes to those metrics, that is really important, and that's also going to be what you help uh, you know, get some of that buy-in with the business. So within Pinnacle, uh, we we actually, our team meets with um, the C-level executives quarterly to talk through kind of the, what we've been doing <laughs> and, and our roadmap of, of the work we're going through within uh, IA, within intelligent automation. And again, that's continuing that evangelization, continuing that innovation um and kind of tying that all together into uh, uh, you know your continuous improvement which is your ia program office well, chris so, something that i always advocate for when building the business case whether the business case is for your program or for an individual business area or even as low as you know a process that you're looking at, at, at addressing with intelligent automation is a holistic business case um i i use four pillars and the reason why i use four different areas to bring together a holistic business case is that as you need to articulate roadshow that business case, you likely are going to set in front of the C-suite and they expect a certain level of story. You're going to set in front of line of business leads and they're going to want a different version of that story. And then if you're talking to the workforce that's being impacted, that's a different version of the story. And so a holistic business case allows you to cherry pick um, and have the right story crafted is a, a business case that addresses the strategic alignment, making sure that your IA program aligns with a larger enterprise strategy. 
whether that is we're going to go into new markets, we're going to add capacity, whatever that larger enterprise strategy is that the executives are really keen on driving, align your IA program and strategy to that. So strategic alignment number one. The second one is the financial impact. What are the investments needed? What are the anticipated benefits? And then the net investment, it's always critical to be upfront with the numbers, especially if you're going to present this out to a CFO and you expect to get you know, budget and programmed in the out years. Third is operational metrics. And so this is going to be really important for those line of business leads, more on the operation side. Um, what is the added throughput? What is the increased compliance? Reduced transaction costs, transaction time, things like that. And then the fourth one that most people don't want to address, but it always comes up, and so it's best to address it head on, is workforce impact. What's the, what's the impact on the workforce? Whether this is we're able to shift people, whether it is we're able to reduce reliance on contract support, um, but there is an impact to the workforce. So, so being able to articulate the workforce impact as part of that business case will allow you to have a very well-crafted and, and, and concise story around the value that your IA program is driving. So we, we've seen uh, dif different researchers make different recommendations as to the best model for an intelligent automation practice. Um, some opt for a centralized um, model. Some opt for a decentralized model with uh, a potentially an uh, intelligent automation program office um, in each region uh, or in each business department. Um, and some advocate a hybrid of both. Um, and I think the reason that um, we see a um, little bit of conflicting advice is that it's actually a complex decision. Um, and there are many factors to weigh up, um, including whether it sits within an IT team or a business change team, transformation or operational excellence. Um, but one of the key considerations is how the CRE is going to be funded. Um, I think you just touched on that, Chris. Um, that's going to drive a good many other decisions. Um, so we've worked with organizations where the CRE sits in an IT department and is um, funded by IT as a governance and compliance structure. Um, and the budget is taken care of by IT. Um, but the, the um, automation building practice sits within the business, makes use of that um, IT function. Um, and uh, that the business benefit pays for the um, automation building. Um, then we've got a, another organization who sat entirely within IT. Um, they were initially funded with an IT budget loan, um, which had to be paid back as business benefits were realized. Um, so that placed a sharp focus on business benefit realization, which in turn um, placed a focus on selecting use cases which would drive a financial um, business benefit. Um, but what, whatever the decision is made, it's not cast into stone. So we think that most organizations start with a centralized COE model and then move to a decentralized or a hybrid model as they get to grips with the technology. Uh, I think that's how you started out as well, Chris. Uh, we did. At Pinnacle, um, we started off centralized everything in IT, uh, the budget, everything. And uh, that... That's all well and good, but like I mentioned before, we, we have a very small team. And so there's only so much work we can do. And when there's an appetite for more work, there's either, hey, give me more people on my team, which wasn't one of the options that I had available to me, or was try to you know build some leaders within the business that can help kind of execute this work. So we settled on a hybrid model. And uh, it's still, uh, I would say, you know, um, funded by, funded by uh, the IS department, but we do have our little branches within the business. Uh, and like I mentioned before, uh, one of our branches is actually executing the robot club. <laughs> so uh, it's it's really, um, the reason I like the hybrid model is it kind of gets buy-in from everybody and it's continuous buy-in. And uh, it's a, uh, continuing along the path of we're working together. This is a partnership. This isn't one group saying, this is what you're gonna do, or this is what is not what you're gonna do. And so the, the work, the way we go about executing work now is um, if the business is coming up with, with, with robots uh, and ideas, they're able to build those. We take a consultative approach where we go and, and, and actually just do a consult, uh, a consult with them on, on what, the, what they're working on, do reviews of the work. And then when something is ready to move up the stack, we execute moving it up the stack.
awesome. Okay. So we've, we've had a few lessons learned, implemented, and scaling intelligent automation. Um, unlike technologies that are the domain of only developers or engineers, um, intelligent automation use cases can be built by appropriately trained and, and skilled engineers um, uh, within the business, so operations or operational ex uh, excellence teams, um, um, maybe with a, a more technical uh, focus, um, uh, who've built small solutions inside the business already. Um, so automation use cases are, are definitely more robust and impactful when they're developed alongside the business teams um, with automation practitioners that are embedded um, within within the business unit. Um, automation practitioners are, are, are more productive that way too. Um, so it's important not to prevent the business from being able to fund their own automation building activities. Um, you just need to make sure it's done in the right way. Um, however, um, uh, it is important that um, you establish sensible rules of engagement, which should be followed in order to gain access to the platform. Um, training and certification, um, adherence to best practices, focus on reuse, um, understanding who to ask for help and, and how to ask, um, consider future upgradability and maintainability of the automations. Um, and you should police access to the platform. Don't be afraid to turn access off if somebody isn't operating within guidance um, and, and bring them back in check because it will have an impact on the sustainability of the platform moving forwards um, if somebody is, is uh, operating in a, in a, in a non-sustainable way. Um, we think that you need to have a, also a focus on breaking down use cases into much smaller chunks um, that can be delivered. Um, but, because that, that serves two purposes. One is um, you're more likely to create smaller reusable assets that you can put into your assets library and then accelerate future automation building. Um, and, and you need to um, think big, um, but start small. Um, you need to actively discourage gold plating. So um, uh, aiming for 100% automation um, it is not the goal. Um, uh, but automating some of a task, um, the um, most traversed and frictionless path will often give enough business benefit to put that automation in, into a production state. Um, and then iteratively dealing with exceptions um, uh, over the next period of time in order to take that um, uh, maybe 50% automation up to 60, 70, 80% automation. Um, don't start with the expectation of being able to eliminate human workload. So um, automations are very good at um, uh, repetitive mundane um, tasks, um, but it's not good at the, the task that the knowledge worker would do, making decisions. Um, and um, uh, making decisions is really what your, your uh, uh, strategic knowledge worker and your strategic teams um, should be involved in. So the the automations and people should live side by side. Um, that, that needs to be a design consideration from day one. Um, that, so, that's, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Chris. I just want to say that that to me is is really the the biggest the biggest thing, and we talk about building building correctly, is that you want to be able to build these as reusable components because you'll be surprised at how often you go into another group and the use case that they're talking about with you is almost identical to something else that was happening within another group, and and so don't build in a vacuum, keep working collaboratively, take that customer center centric approach and and you'll be very successful if you follow those steps. So so we also touched on um, continuous in innovation. Um, the technology is just moving at such a fast pace. Um, it's important to have strong relationship with your vendor and understand their roadmap um, and um, continue your roadmap alongside your vendor's roadmap understand what they've got coming in in the pipeline, what's going to help you um, to, to increase the reach um, of those automations. I agree 100%. Our, our roadmap basically focuses on the items that are up here. We are really looking this year now to extend our automation for chatbots. Uh, we want to start working more with our data scientist team that we have within Pinnacle. And then we want to start more uh, getting into the cognitive uh, recognition using kind of that document 
uh, management OCR type technology that's now becoming available and leverage that to our the best we can. Okay, great. Well, this is Dan Goodstein. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Chris and, and David, especially the you know this this storytelling is is really invaluable. Uh, uh, as, as, as somebody who's been kind of in between uh, clients who are trying to figure this out and, and uh, uh, this stuff's kind of keeping them up at night, as they say, uh, this, this uh, kind of candid uh, story is just, is just invaluable. So thank you so much. Um, and Chris, thank you for sharing the, the Pinnacle story. I really appreciate it. Um, so we have a few minutes left for, for Q&A, and uh, I want to get to a couple of the questions I've seen come in. Uh, thus far, um, and the, the first one is for, for Chris at Pinnacle. So, you know, you touched uh, uh, on the future roadmap and um, and kind of where this is going. Where do you see RPA and other technologies like OCR or BPM intersecting uh, in the business? Have you thought through these use cases at all? Uh, we definitely have. I, I was touching on it a little bit there at the end. Uh, so we 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 have. Um, technologies in-house for doing OCR and for doing business um, process management. And so, uh, but they're, they're kind of scattered out about, uh, I would say a few different technologies. So we're looking at the use cases where we can kind of tie those into potentially um, just intelligent automation. And, and then there'll be all probably some other use cases where we'll have to uh, maybe intersect with them a little bit differently and interact with them a little bit differently. But that is that is a very big um, uh, item on our roadmap. You know, another thing I could have talked about for challenges is you know consolidation. So there, you know, when when you go through and are working with many technologies, there's tech debt and there's opportunity to consolidate. And uh, intelligent automation, in 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 particular, uh, can can fit a lot of older technologies and kind of take those use cases and put them on a modern platform. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you. And um, so a question for you, David, and then you know, Chris, if you want to jump in, of course. Um, so somebody here is saying, you know, that their company is yet to implement a COA, uh, COE or intelligent automation program office, as you guys kind of uh, referred to it. Uh, so they're on the business side, not the IT side, and they've seen benefits you know, related to RPA in that in that uh, kind of context. Uh, but they know they want to kind of expand it to, to other areas. So So what advice would you give this person around yeah, how do you get from kind of there to uh, the the nirvana, if you will? So uh, I, I, I guess the first. Oh, I was going to say that the, the, the first, my first answer to that is I'd be happy to continue a conversation, I guess, um, and uh, uh, under, uh, understand exactly how we might be able to help. Um, it is something we're doing with a number of organisations. Um, uh, I, I think. Um, uh, evaluating technology is so not just understanding the business benefit but taking some time to evaluate the technology and understand um, whether it's for you um, so we we offer a, a, a downloadable uh, version of our RPA platform. Um, that, that might be a place to start. Um, uh, you can use that to um, evaluate whether whether the, the automation use cases can be automated. Um, maybe we just continue the conversation from there. Something something I would offer up is if you've already proven out RPA and you're looking to extend further, my guess is that some of the use cases that you've already applied RPA to, you could very, very easily extend the automation, the end-to-end -end automation, and improve the return on investment um, by starting with something you've already, you've already incrementally through RPA would realize some, some benefits from. An example would be uh, let's say within a CFO function, I know a lot of you are likely starting within a CFO function just due to the volume and the rules-based nature and repetitive nature of that work. The CFO function within an enterprise is a target-rich environment. So within a CFO function, let's say you're going to do something within record to report or say it's P2P, purchase the payment. Within purchase the payment, requisitioning materials or accounts payable is something that we see all the time. Now, what we see, though, is when you only apply RPA to accounts payable, your starting point for your RPA project is structured data, and you've automated from that point forward, and that's great. But there is likely, if you move left of that, un of that structured data, there is a lot of unstructured data, documents coming in from various vendors that you just excluded because RPA couldn't pick it up. 
So starting with a process that you've already automated with RPA and evangelized, so, so articulated the business case to external stakeholders, and you've got them bought into that, I think extending off of a quick win as opposed to trying to bring something heavy in and apply it to something net new is the way to go. That's good advice, Chris. Good advice. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, Christopher. So, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, the challenges you face from a from a technology perspective? Things like integration, exceptions, uh, you know, maybe handwritten content, any user and, and any user resistance uh, during the rollout. Can you talk more about that? Um, you definitely face user resistance, and that's where uh, where I'm talking about. You know, being empathetic with the business, you you kind of have to get in, in their shoes. Um, but uh, part of that was part of the reason why we actually wanted to start small and get kind of a groundswell going. So we started small, went with several small projects, working with the business, getting their buy-in. Then we did a, um, a corporate-wide lunch and learn so that we, the business could present the work that had been done and talk, you know, talk to the, the results. And so it wasn't us up there kind of pushing the technology or pushing the work, it was the business driving it. Um, but even, you know, even with that, whenever you're going and doing implementations, there, there's going to be challenges and you just have to be very pragmatic in, in how you approach those and, um, and just uh, be very gentle in, in your conversations and, and, and very strategic in your thoughts and, and your executions of those. Um, the, other, the other thing I would say is around integrations is that we've actually found the tool to be very flexible for integrations. And so we, we haven't run into any. We've, we've done very many use cases of, of using our, uh, um, RPA as, a, as an API, using it as a web service, using it for desktop automation, um, using it for integrating items into Salesforce, for example, or into Oracle databases. And so it's been very flexible. And that is one area I say we really haven't had too much of a problem with it's um it's been it's been very successful and we haven't had any pushback from the business or on the is side around that either chris a real life example of one that's something we did with uh to eliminate the fear factor to mitigate it if you will and uh, this is with the u.s treasury we're building a financial management shared service center using bots not butts um so and that's trademark so you guys can't take that so we what we wanted to do there is that the workforce, the workforce had that, that that fear of uncertainty, as all should. And to your point, Chris, being empathetic and understanding that, addressing it up front is the way to go. What we do is, if you sit down with the people that are going to be impacted by RPA at the beginning of that pilot, and you and you use just your iPhone and you record um, a, a sit down session, just ask them questions. What are your thoughts on RPA? You're going to see that they are going to lean back away from you, arms crossed, and they're going to articulate this fear of uncertainty, and you're going to see it on their face. Same thing, this is a 12-week pilot. Six weeks in, record the same thing. Ask the questions around, hey, now that you have a chance to be part of the design and the develop phase of this, and you're starting to understand the value of it, what are your thoughts on it? You're going to see them lean in a little bit more. You're going to see them start to crack a smile and talk positive about it because now they're educated on it. Same thing at the end of the pro project when it's been in production. Do you see value moving forward of RPA? You're going to see them totally lean in, smile ear to ear, and talk about this robot as a coworker. You take those three clips, put it in a two and a half minute video, use that during your quarterly town halls with all of the employees, during the brown bags and the lunch and learns, and you are going to, in a very overwhelming fashion, quickly win over the workforce. That's how I've been able to address this at scale through a center of excellence. That's great, that's great. Well, gentlemen, we have to uh, leave it there. We're just about out of time, but uh, you know, thanks again, Christopher, for, for sharing your story, and, and, and thanks to our friends, uh, Chris, David, and the whole team over at uh, COFAX for supporting this series and uh, a lot of the different activities we do here at ERPA. We really appreciate uh, your support. Uh, for those of you who want to continue the conversation, we will make our team and the, and the COFAX team available for any questions that we didn't get to. 
Um, and uh, on the upcoming event side, we've got a, a couple uh, more webinars planned for uh, this month, actually both of them uh, revolving around the, the contact center, both from a buy side perspective and a service provider uh, perspective. So check those out. Uh, and we have our uh, digital Oasis Roadshow series coming to a, a city near you. So take a look at that schedule. Uh, hopefully uh, you can join us at one of our face-to-face -face, uh, member events as we kind of hit the road uh, for the first half of the year uh, and uh, get the story out. Scale will be a big part of that um, uh, that conversation as well. So thanks everybody for joining and uh, thanks again everybody who uh, participated today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.